Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> This week on Tales of Tyria. It's the release date! Yes! Finally! I can't believe it! It's happening! Yes, welcome one, welcome all, welcome to Tales of Tyria, the Guild Wars 2 podcast right here in the Sound Strategy Network, partnered with TeamLegacy.net. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a bunch of new Team Legacy guys here today to help us out. We're glad you got a hold of the program, however you may have found it. Tell a friend or two, won't you? We are almost live from, um, well, from the Ascalonian Catacombs, as it happens, because this week we're going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons, as it were. Uh, quickly wanted to give a quick uh, shout out. Thanks everybody who helped push us over 5,000 subscribers. We're, uh, we're we're very happy that we got that. We're going to be in the uh, process of trying to get some uh, partnership deals going on with uh, YouTube. So that was a uh, big help. So big shout out to everybody who helped us with that. Uh, and uh, also huge thanks to Michael, Cameron, Zachary, and Ian for donating this week. Uh, that's a link on the main website, talesofteria.com is how you can find us. And uh, you can feel free to donate, but do not feel obligated. Uh, <laughs> Uh, also, send us feedback. Feedback is at feedback at talesofteria.com. And I'd like to remind everybody that we are live recording this every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. But I also want to mention that we're going to be trying to do another show earlier for the European uh, listeners who might not normally be able to watch live. And that may be next week. So keep track of that, and uh, we will continue on here. Let me introduce myself. I am Bridger. I'll be the host for today. And we've got a great panel for you. This is a bunch of, bunch of new guys here joining us. Um, in addition, uh, Edwin, coming back. Welcome, sir. Hello, Bridger. Nah, uh, hello, hello. How, how's everything going for you? Pretty good. I got a job in real life, so I have something to do now when I'm not gaming. Awesome, awesome. All right, also joining us for the first time ever, Prowl, the symbol of awesome, <laughs> without a webcam. Hey, Thank Bridget, you, sir. What's going on? Uh, hello, hello. He's uh, another Team Legacy member here helping me out because uh, uh, you may have noticed the regular crew is off tonight. Thank you very much for jumping on here and filling in Prowl. Anytime. Also, also joining us, Umf. Welcome, sir. Hey, glad to be here. Uh, and, uh, again, they are, uh, helping to fill in. Kai is unfortunately moving this week. She would have been perfect for this because she's done a lot of the dungeons. We wanted to get her on. Uh, I know a lot of people are like, what happened to Kai? She's, she's moving, so she doesn't have bandwidth, uh, where she is right now. Uh, well, or internet at all, period, I guess you could say. Uh, it looked like Vega wasn't going to be able to make a night due to, uh, you know, real life things. And I was talking to Freelancer, I'm like, hey, do you want to come and talk about dungeons? And he's like, I've... Never set foot inside the Ascalonian catacombs. And I was like, oh, okay. Well then, uh, that about wraps that discussion up. Uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs> so uh, maybe. We'll see. All right. Uh, so with that having been said, covering the introductions, let's jump into the program here. Uh, we have some interesting results from last week's poll right now. And uh, we're going to pull those up for you right now. Last week we were asking, remember we talked about streaming last week. Now, I don't know if you guys uh, do, do any streaming at all. Do you plan to do any streaming? Anybody? Oh, I've got a stream of my own, yes. Yeah, so it's umph with a whole bunch of Fs. You can see my <laughs> here every Sunday night as I sit in the chat room and watch you do your things. But, uh, yes, I have been doing some streaming of my own. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so what we were asking our audience was, uh, are you going to be watching streams, watching videos, uh, creating videos, etc.? And it looks like uh, most people are going to be interested in watching videos, uh, YouTube videos of guides. That's the, the, the largest percentage. We've got about 30% with that. Um, and what most people are looking for 
in uh, in in the in their streamer video is humor and personality. That's number one with 36 percent, and second up is uh, strong explanatory skills and teaching. And then the last one is uh, expert play. But they all got a pretty high percentage there, so that's a very interesting discussion. Again, um, great to take plant take part of these discussions after the show. Highly recommend you guys check that out. Now we did have another piece of feedback from one of our listeners uh, who basically said, uh, "quote when." You guys were talking about recording software. I know you can't cover all of them, but I would have loved to hear your opinion on Bandicam. I've been doing some tests of my own and comparing it to Fraps, and here are my findings. Pros, significantly less hard drive space, as low as 10% of the space required at the same time, and no recognizable loss of quality. Same FPS drop on recording with games that are already below 30 FPS. Uh, also, controllable FPS limiter, a watermark that can be placed in the video as it's being compressed and recorded, higher max FPS while recording, and the cons is that it doesn't have that loop for the last 30 seconds. Uh, so thank you, um, uh, unquote. Uh, thank you, Dan, for letting us know all of those uh, different things there. Uh, basically, uh, he's sounds, sounds like he's putting a, a thorough uh, recommendation there for Bandicam, and that's just one that I hadn't tried myself, so we didn't talk about it last week because of that. But uh, I still recommend Fraps, but it sounds like Bandicam is also a decent alternative. Like I said last week, all of these have free trials, so check them out if you have any interest in all that. So let's jump right into the big, big news of the week. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is it. This is it. The big final announcement. Airships. I love how much they're featuring airships. That looks really cool. It's a dirigible. A lot of stuff we've never seen before, including this. Let's take a quick pause here and look at this. This is uh, the, the trailer, the announcement trailer. And a lot of people have been making a big deal over this particular spot right here. Because it looks like a dragon made of dragons, which is how Zaitan has been referred to in the past. What are your guys' thoughts? Is this Zaitan? Um... It's gigantic, so it's possible. I mean... It doesn't seem that big, though. I mean, it seems as big as an airship. I feel like it would be bigger. Oh, if you like, course. You feel like Zaitan should be absolutely Im immense. Is that where you're coming from? Yeah. I mean... Well, they said... They said Krakatork's wings spread from horizon to horizon, so... Yeah. But I, mean, I think just for uh, Orz's sake, I, I call them dirigibles, not airships. <laughs> dirigibles? I love dirigibles. But yeah, I don't know. somebody else pointed out, you know, maybe this thing is actually, like, you know, a mile away, and that's how big it is. It doesn't look like that, though. Um, a, a lot of people are speculating that this is actually a champion of Zaitan, and that's why it has the same features of, of Zaitan of being, like, a dragon made out of dragons. Because, I mean, it's the undead dragon, right? It's basically, you know, I, you think of, like, uh, a lot of people have described it Cthulhu-like in the number of, like, tentacle-type things that it has, and, you know, a mouth made of dragons. So, we, I don't think this would... I, I mean, come on. Would they put Zaitan right here in the trailer for everybody to see? Probably not. Probably not. So, I mean, it's it's a really freaking cool trailer when you look at it, and boom, there you go, 828, 8, 12. Um, and then, uh, so, so freaking finally, it's so good to finally have the, uh, the release date, like, there. So now, when people say, oh, when's that game coming out? We can't go, um, well, we don't when know. When it's ready. <laughs> we have no idea. We've been doing a podcast since last October, and we don't know yet. <laughs> So it's really good to get that. Hey, hey, I know you're excited, but you have to contain yourself. She's very excited as well. I, I really want to be surprised. I really uh, want to be surprised if it was a, like a, a, a short snippet of Zaitan. This is to kind of get you amped about that final boss and about what you're going to be working towards in the PvE content. So you actually have something to look forward to being like, wow, that's the boss. He's gigantic. These dirigibles are fighting against him. Yeah, I want to do that, and I want to get there. Oh, don't get me wrong. This, I mean, that trailer looked awesome with the fighting of that thing and the dirigibles and the guns and everything. Um, that was great in and of itself. I just feel like, based on the concept art that they've been showing, and they're like, oh, by the, and the, you know how they pimp out like when they showed um, 
to coddle. They're like, this is one of our smaller dragons. Her, her, her. You know, that whole, like, cocky, like, you haven't seen, you ain't seen nothing yet thing. That really says to me, oh, yeah, I should probably do that. That really says to me that um, <laughs> the, the, the major thing here is that it's, it's going to be huge. It's got to be. Right? Yeah. So, anyway... Everybody's really excited about that. Let's jump into... Oh, by the way, Head Start is confirmed for 825. Uh, that is absolutely guaranteed. Uh, so that, that's actually fantastic. It's going to start on a, on a Saturday, right? That's great. Everybody's going to be happy about that. You're going to get to Saturday. You're going to get the ne whole next week off. So you get Saturday to the following Sunday. Tons and tons of Guild Wars 2 time. Now, this is something that somebody pointed out. And this is something... I don't remember... Did you guys... See this uh, this image here of the of the ArenaNet Studios, where they have the the six twenty eight twelve uh, shown in um, essentially soccer jerseys on they the wall. They swear up and down that that's just coincidence that there are three people that have left the company, and whenever somebody left the company, they put a jersey up with their with their things on it. But it seems rather. Well, yeah, no, they, I mean, obviously Megaphone. it means something at, at post, post hoc. Um, so, well, the funny thing about that, you know who took that image? Was it one of the fans going through on like a fan day? No, it was Ruby. Oh, that was before she was with before Arena Before she was. While she was still with Massively, <laughs> she took that image. And then one of her, one of the people out of Massively said, well, that's got to mean something. And. They came up back and said, absolutely not. No, that, that doesn't mean anything. This is how this goes on. And who was the person who was manning the uh, Twitter account on 62812? Well, it was Ruby. <laughs> yeah, you know what, though? I wonder, do you think that was always like, it was that something like, okay, we have an internal date for when we're going to announce the release date, and let's just have some fun and put it on the wall here. Was that these people actually had those numbers, and they like, you know what, let's try to nail that number, because wouldn't it be funny if? Like, what order did that happen in? Right. They fired them the day before they put that up. So have <laughs> I'm sorry, R. Scott. We have to let you go so that we can we can put this <laughs> elaborate joke together. <laughs> I, I think somebody actually asked Ruby about that on the Twitter account, and she swears up and down it was just a coincidence. Well, you know, with the amount of preparation that has to go with a release date, I I have to imagine that it's a coincidence, right? I mean, or or maybe they're like, you know, let's we're well, already aiming for this week. Let's do it on this specific day because. Well, we all know how ArenaNet works, so if they could ever possibly make a date to re schedule the release date on, and this pet popped up in the past, I think they would work their butts off to make that date be the date that Apollos, they Apollos Flash in the chat is confused. Yes, that's correct. It is June 28th, but June 28th was the day that they announced it, right? That's, that's, that, that's what makes this very intriguing and, like, what's going on here and conspiracy theories everywhere, you know? Um, so anyway, uh, that was very interesting. Let's, uh, let's jump on to the next piece here. We talked about this. We talked about this. What's next coming up? Now, here's an interesting piece. Somebody on Reddit during the stress test got, uh, to talk with John Peters and, uh, oh, no, sorry, not John Peters, Tyler Bierce. Um, and, and that's, uh, an ArenaNet employee there. And he basically said that, uh, Snow Mist is going to be closed at the beginning from now on. And I got the, I'll pull this up here so you can see it. Um, if I can hit the button, there we go. Ah, there we go. Uh, he said, yes, we are going to close the doors on Stone Mist. And presumably that means at the beginning of the match, because everybody pointed out that, you know, over the beta weekends at that midnight hour, everybody just bum rushes Stone Mist and tries to get there as soon as possible to try and just immediately claim it, because it's so easy to just walk in the doors and kill the Keep Lord if you've got a giant Zerg. So I think this is going to really positively affect the game if you have to actually spend some time grabbing supplies, harassing the enemy team so they can't take down their set of doors, or waiting until they take down their set of doors and then rushing in behind them and slaughtering them and letting them pay all the supply? Like, uh, what do you guys think? Is this a good change? It could be if they implement it correctly. Uh, I do think that uh, having that big central piece there in the worldy world map, it's going, as it is, as it is now, it just draws people to it because mm -hmm. everybody wants it. So I think the fact that they are going to make that a game and part of a, a, a little mini meta, if you will, that uh, it, could be, it could be really good for the game. 
I, I feel like it kind of changes the dynamic of world versus world. It, instead of rushing towards stone, stone mist, now you actually have the option of, hey, we might go take two keeps and three supply camps mm -hmm. while they're beating on the door. So now we have the opportunity of taking a couple other spots that have a better strategic position instead of just everybody rush to stone mist. We need to get it right now. Otherwise, we're not going to have a chance at it. You at least have that little bit of a buffer to work with and actually plan around. Well, I realized it takes about four to five. It doesn't take too long to break down a gate, but it takes a heck of a lot longer than just running in and killing a champion. I don't think it's just and, the, the time to take down the gate, though. Remember, when you start, theoretically, unless they – well, right now, I think if you had supply previously, you can take it into the next match. But if they fix it so that when World v. World resets, you don't get to take the supply with you, then you're going to have to wait and get some supply camps at least to get, you know – what is it, uh, 30 supply for a ram, so you need to get, you know, 60 like supply or something before you can get both doors down? Yeah, so with really good planning, if you have enough people, easily you could just run in as long as they don't fix that thing where you keep your supply when you leave and come back. I think they should fix it just so that you don't have the ability to do that. But at the same time, it I think supplies every minute it gets 10 so it would take a good while to get enough supply to actually take down stone mist. It would be much more beneficial just to go around taking keeps and towers and stuff. They're worth a lot more points total than uh, stone mist is. All right, Freelancer wants in on this conversation, it sounds like. So we're going to try to draw him in here, even though I don't know how we're going to fit him. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> mentioned World v. World. We must have the Freelancer. <laughs> Apparently that's the case. So we're going to have a really screwed up conversation here because I'm not going to have time to fix this. But that's okay. <laughs> Freelancer wants to chat. We'll see how it works. All right, we got a kind of semblance of things going on here. Hello. Hey, Welcome. how's it going? I heard you were talking about World v. World. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was going to be PvE. So this is, supposed to, this is supposed to be a PvE episode, and here you are talking about World v. World without me? I'll tell you. Well, you know, sometimes that's what happens. So what are, what are your nerve. thoughts on this whole thing? Uh, what are we talking about? About the stone mist <laughs> About stone no, mist no, closing. Kidding. Stone, stone mist. Uh, stone mist. What? Say it again. Stone mist. Apparently, based on this uh, report from the stress test, uh, one of the admins mentioned that stone mist is going to be closing uh, it, the gates, basically at the beginning when World v. World resets. Uh, I think it's awesome. I mean, if you remember, uh, all the guilds and stuff running around to do this mass exodus to claim everything at once as soon as the servers reset. Uh, that's not exactly, you know, fun because then it's based on who has more in their guild. And when it comes to that, I mean, then you're just encouraging Zergs. And how much fun is that, right? Absolutely. So that's, that's my thoughts on it. I think it's a good idea. Um, are they going to add guards and stuff too, or is it just, That's a good know, question. It... I kind of would like to see some neutral guards on there personally. Yeah. If it's just guards, uh, like guards and just neutral, if it's just a neutral point period, I think it's great. Um, I still like to see smaller guilds that are more organized and more capable of taking down these points faster than large mass Zerg guilds, you know, and that's that encourages that. Whereas large mass Zerg guilds, they could cover all the different points at once. And how much fun is that when they claim everything and you're more organized than they are? Yeah, and, and I just like the idea of like bringing supply back into it. Really, is 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 when there's no doors on Stone Mist, it's a race, and you don't you you say screw the supply, it's not worth it. If we can get Stone Mist, those doors close, and that's like guaranteed points because nobody has supply at the beginning. This way, it's that race doesn't have to happen, and everybody basically is pressured into doing that race. It has to you have to do it because it's worth so many points, and it's guaranteed points because if you take it first the walls close and enemies can't take it until they build up a huge amount of supply so I, I, I like the fact that we're prolonging the battle for stone mist to be more than just a race I look at it also uh, think of it like this uh, playing risk have you ever played the risk board game yes mm -hmm. okay so the risk board game you start off by passing out cards and you place these armies you place one army on every part of the board right now, why do you do that versus just putting all of your armies on one spot and then having all these empty spaces? Well, the reason being is it still gives you that risk factor when you go to take different parts on the board. So I'm a huge risk player. I love risk. You know, and World v. World obviously fits you know, in line with that. But you still, when you place these points as neutral points, you have to consider with your guild that the, this keep's going to take this amount of time or this given tower is going to take this amount of time. So... Uh, it adds that factor, whereas before, 
it didn't matter, you know. And uh, I think I just think it's a plus all the way around. Gotcha. I, I, I agree with you entirely, and I'm really excited. Uh, hopefully, that's in for beta weekend number three, and we can really test it out and see how it goes. Uh, you know, because <laughs> I was I was part of those things when we stayed up until 3 a.m. Now, that's something actually I wanted to talk to you. Do you think that come release, like let's say Tuesday is the day that they decide they're going to refresh it every two weeks on a Tuesday, what's a good time to actually refresh that? Is it really going to be 3 a.m.? Oh, you're opening a can of words there, worms there. That's a huge um, question. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what, Bridger. I'm gonna let everybody else have a say in this because I'm very opinionated. Um, there is a big, big problem with Oceanic Guilds be, being forced, and, and they don't have a choice. So it's not their fault. But there is a big, big problem with Oceanic Guilds being forced onto the American servers because that creates a imbalance to where us as American players, most of us being towards the East Coast, there's a large majority in the West Coast as well, but most players being centralized about around the Central Eastern time zone, when they go to sleep, these servers they're going up against that have a large majority of Oceanics uh, guilds, like for example, the last two BWEs had Sea of Sorrows was very well known for it. Um, you go to sleep and you lose everything overnight. So all of the big battles, all of the the reason we're playing Guild Wars 2, the world v world, etc. Um, it, it's it's happening when you're sleeping. So you know how much fun is that? And on, it's not like they have a choice either. Our the time we go to sleep is the time they start waking up. So. Yeah. The winners it's, don't sleep. Yeah, that's what I was just reading the chat. Well, Very I mean, I said winners don't sleep. 4 a.m. in the morning, but even then, you know, prime time for Oceanic Guilds is very much towards, you know, heck, by the time I'm sleeping in in the morning or going to work. I mean, most gamers, I... <laughs> and most, if not job, is school. You know, I'd say the majority, just to be safe, are doing something in the morning for... Oceanic guilds, that's their prime time. That is, you know, they're popping their Red Bulls or whatever they drink in <laughs> Australia, and they're playing, and they're taking all of your keeps while you're at work. I don't mind them getting together and taking all my keeps, but I want to be there to experience and try to defend those keeps. Right, you know? exactly. And that's that's part of the whole immersion factor, and it's a big problem. Um, so what alliances and what guilds and what servers have to do now just to ensure that there's a fair fight is bring on Oceanic Guilds and stuff onto their server or make sure they have Oceanic Guilds. In terms of the rollover time, uh, it's a big disadvantage the way they had it set up where uh, 2 a.m. was... Uh, was it 2 a.m. or 3 a.m.? for 3 a.m. Eastern. It was midnight Pacific. Yeah, midnight Pacific, okay. 3 a.m. for the Eastern. 3 a.m. So at 3 a.m., most people with lives are going at least getting tired of going to sleep. <laughs> okay? So at 3 a.m., you know, the majority of servers, the U.S. servers, are going to sleep. Well... At that time, the servers reroll. Oceanic gets first dibs on not only claiming everything that's neutral, but also upgrading it. So, Bridger, when me and you and Team Legacy, we go out there in World v. World the next day at around 4 or 5 o'clock or whenever we start getting home from work, we're not facing neutral points like the Oceanic Guilds got, mm -hmm. got to first. We're facing upgraded keeps. We're facing upgraded guards. And that's where the imbalance comes in. Not so much the players, but because of the fact that where the servers restart now, Oceanic Guilds have a huge advantage of getting out there first. And not only that, now there's probably fewer Oceanic Guilds just because there's usually a smaller population of Oceanic players compared to Europeans and, and, and uh, North Americans. Or, well, the Americas, I guess. But mm -hmm. the, the main issue there is if the Oceanic Guilds join specific servers, like there were actually for the beta, obviously, there were servers that were like, this is the Oceanic server, we should all meet up here or there's other like you know like the for example our alliance has resonance the has, we we one of the main re you know not one of the, the a beneficial reason to getting <laughs> resonance into the alliance is because they are an oceanic guild because that will give our server a pretty large advantage in that vein if oh, there absolutely. are servers I mean... that don't have that Oceanic Guild, they're going to be vastly disadvantaged if the time is that late. Well, even if it isn't that, that late. Well, but, giving uh, a shout out to Resonance, you know, one of the big things we realized that when we were when we did the first BWE um, is that these other bigger alliances had these large Oceanic Guilds in them, and Darkhaven, one of the the bigger servers we faced with Reddit on it. You know, we did fine when it was prime time U.S. You know, Eastern Time Zone, and we were out there and we were claiming the map and we were taking more points and defending more points than they were. That was fine. Where we where we made the mistake was realizing that when we go to sleep, 
Well, Reddit has Oceanic players, and they have European players, and we're getting annihilated. We wake up the next morning with our server completely taken over by them. So we had to break down and say, okay, who are some of the, the bigger uh, Oceanic guilds, and not only so, so much bigger, but more reputable Oceanic guilds? And we got a hold of a, a lot of different guilds, Residents obviously being among the best. Um, and it, it, we had to do that. Alliances have to do that. Unfortunately, that's the position ArenaNet puts us in because without having a solid, incredible guild like Resonance on our side, we, are, we'll, we will, no matter how great we are in the Eastern Time Zone, we will always be at a disadvantage against a server it's that okay, does it's have It's okay. Oceanic Freelancer guild. will just bankroll the entire guild's real life so they can quit their jobs <laughs> and we can rotate. I'm just kidding. All right. We got to pull so, this. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Real quick, real quick. So the beta weekends are different. We only have three days to play as much as we can for the entire month. When you're playing a game that's already released and it's a two-week time span for the thing, you're not as rushed to play as much as you can. So I think that you know, that feeling that you have to play and you have to capture everything right away, I don't think it will feel as important, especially when we have two weeks to make our stake and win. Yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna pull this back because freelancers stole the 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 the, <laughs> the, 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 the Sorry. The, everybody's been asking for more PVE stuff, and uh, I did want to cover this though because it's a pretty interesting and dif differently a, a great change to Stone Mist. So I don't know if you want to stick around and talk dungeons at all, freelancer. I, I played Ascalonian Catacombs. I'll I'll, I'll stick around. Oh, yeah. you didn't say that before. You're like, oh, I didn't play that noob. Get well, I face. didn't say I enjoyed it, but I'll tell you why I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> How about that? All Does right, that all right. Let's jump into the last few things here in the news, and then we'll get into the actual uh, the actual um, uh, discussion topic for tonight. Uh, now, here is a very interesting thing. No, not you. What are you doing? I fixed you. You get over here, out of my face. There we go. Okay. Now, this is where I wanted to be. Okay, so we've got uh, a here that somebody put together. This kind of came out last week uh, before the show and I didn't get to it, but this is a very interesting map. This is a map pulled out of the data file of the entire planet of Tyria. It's actually a globe that somebody flattened out so that we could look at it and they've overlaid the maps from Guild Wars 1 slash Guild Wars 2 on here. So if we zoom in a little bit, you'll recognize... Actually, if I, if I correctly move it here, here's the Tyria that we know. Or is down here. Divinity's Reach is up here. Lion's Arch is over here. Uh, and then down here we have uh, Cantha and Elona. Um, and wait, I got that backwards. This is Elona, that's Cantha. And so just looking at how massive the planet is, like there's a lot of room for expansions here. This is very yeah. interesting. So definitely check that out. There's a link in the show notes if you guys want to check that out. Um, let's see here. What else do we have? Uh, there's some cool new concept art that was released. There's a link in the show notes. I don't really want to take up time with that. But here's a very interesting interview with Eric Flanham. And I think there's some interesting things here. And it kind of goes to the design of Guild Wars 2 and what they decided to go with. I'm going to quote this real quick. Eric says, quote, I think there are a few different things that people refer to when describing things feeling floaty. There are a number of bugs with things like player shadows, footsteps, etc. And I did just fix camp, so how did it... Oh, okay, that's why. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hitting the wrong button here. Uh, the other thing is that people point to uh, involves our use of transition animations when we make our animations look and feel smoother. In many games, when they use transition animations, they will restrict movement to match the animation. Instead of doing that, we opted to make our movement more responsive, so that while the animation way look like the character is transitioning from one movement set to another, he's actually already moving in the new direction. This may help contribute to the floaty feel that some complain about, but we feel that in the long run, it's a good compromise between smooth-looking animations and responsiveness. There is a distinct possibility that we'll see one or both of those... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the next part is he's responding to whether or not Silvari are, or Asura will be in the next beta weekend event. He said there's a distinct possibility, but we haven't locked down the content yet, so he can't confirm it. So that's kind of interesting. There's a possibility we'll see Asura or Silvari in the next beta weekend event. But let's talk about that first thing. Now, that's a really interesting design choice. They basically said... We're okay with the game feeling and looking a little weird if it means our characters control really solidly and tight. And that, I think, is a, a very a very good design choice if you're going for that eSports that they're talking about. If it takes you, you know, a half a second for your character to change direction and go in a new direction, those controls are not going to feel tight. And it's not going to feel like you're in really control of your character. I mean, League of Legends, when you click somewhere else, your character instantly spins around and starts moving in that direction. There's not really a lot of acceleration or anything like that. So, I don't know. Is there any dissenting opinion? Anybody think this is the, a bad idea? 
I do not think it's a bad idea at all. Um, I like the fact that I like what they've done with their animations. I like the fact that if I push a direction, I'm going in that direction. I think their animations are great, especially if you're targeting someone and you're running diagonally. Your character kind of keeps glancing back over. I mean, that's kind of a cool little quirk, but at the same time, it shows that they really do care about how the character looks. It's not like WoW, where if you're targeting something behind you, you're just running away from it for no reason. Mm -hmm. They actually care how the character looks and how it feels when you play, and I think that's important. You can take that a step away from motion as well. If you uh, if your character is on an uneven surface, their the character's feet reflect that unevenness. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing to consider here is not so much the way things look, um, you know, sort of the way they feel, but the fact that now I can run away from an enemy, or an enemy can run, be running away from me, and they can't shoot like behind them in some crazy manner. You know, you remember yeah. when you could do that? I mean, that was insane. <laughs> you could do a sword swipe forward, but somehow it shot a projectile behind you. Are you uh, talking you about this was in WoW? Right? This was in WoW? Or... No, this was this in Guild in Wars. If you remember oh, the in the first beta weekend. Oh, the first um, beta weekend. Okay, okay. And it seemed to be mostly fixed in the second one, but in the first beta weekend, uh, as a Mesmer, I could do a lot of my ranged attacks as I'm running away, directly looking away from my enemy, and they would actually go, you know, it would go through me and hit the enemy behind me like you didn't actually have to be facing the enemy we uh we talked about that an episode a long time ago but i'm glad they fixed that particularly all right so the last couple things here okay uh there's a detailed list of stealable items that the thief uses for their thief uh, the steal skill uh which is a really cool thing if you want to play thief you probably want to know what things are possible to steal like a lot of thieves point out it's very random and it's not something you want to really rely on for pvp but you're probably going to be using the thief skill to jump in there and grab th you know just to close the distance or to get a little bit of stealth or something like that um uh so i think it's probably good for thieves to check out there's a link in the show notes it's a pretty cool list it's got all the different things and what they do um there's one more thing i wanted to show here and that is remember last week we talked about how to enjoy the little things in guild wars uh well what we have here is one of those little things when you when the elementalist goes into tornado mode there's a very small chance for the following thing to happen okay the guy's getting up here comes the tornado tornado's firing firing hey, what whoa what is that that is a cow fi flying out of the tornado <laughs> like like twister style like in the movie <laughs> where the cow's just flying around just like yep that's a, that, you can tell it's a real tornado because there's a cow flying out of it. <laughs> All it needs is a moo. Just in case you weren't sure if that was a tornado coming at you. Yeah. <laughs> that visual cue helps out. Absolutely. That's, that's just one of the things that ArenaNet does that really makes their games awesome. Um, so that's about it. Uh, there was something else that I wanted to talk about. I've been reading up on these forums and... I keep seeing the same thing every time. It's usually when I go to MMORPG.com because I just want to blow my head away. Uh, I, I, I see people all the time saying something along the lines of, oh, well, it's pay to win. And most of the time they're referring to things and I get into that mode where it's like, I don't think that word means what you think it means. And it just makes me so frustrated. And when I get frustrated, I get angry. And when I get angry, I got to vent. And when I vent, it's called a bridge rant. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have to go into a, the, the bridge rant here. Say, here's the deal. What does play to w pay to win mean? It means that you pay money to get something that makes you more powerful so that you can win. Now, what does winning mean, right? Let's break down win, okay? Winning doesn't mean I have more fun than you or I do things faster than you in a freaking single-player cooperative experience. That's not the definition of winning, okay? The definition of winning is that if you and me are, are fighting each other in chess and I pay $20 and I get four queens instead of pawns, that's pay to win! But if I'm playing Mario and I buy a mushroom for 20 cents and it makes me bigger, that's not pay to win, okay? There's no win there. It's just my experience. The whole goal of that is for me to have fun. It's not to win against another player. There's no pay to win there. It may be pay to break the game. If you're saying I play this game for a challenge and now that I've paid money to get a really awesome... 
awesome item. Now, now it breaks the game. Fine, you can make that argument if you want. I don't want things in the game that could potentially ruin my experience because it takes the challenge out. Okay, I understand that. But you know what? If if you don't have to buy that and it doesn't and it takes a challenge out you can say i'm going to beat it without using those things maybe there's an achievement for that for all i know but the main thing here is people use pay to win as an argument for the fact that other people are paying for things and it's making their lives easier and that affects me no it doesn't if that guy levels faster, it doesn't affect you. If he gets more karma, it doesn't affect you. If he gets a little bit more money from magic items, it doesn't affect you. Play the game! Now, if you want to tell me, well, the game is actually uh, balanced for people to spend money, and so people who don't spend money are disadvantaged to the point where it's frustrating, that's a good argument. That's a completely separate argument from pay to win. So stop throwing that term around like it means anything in the cooperative world. All right? That's all I got to say about that. Wow, I just it's gonna be okay, Bridger. I went Forrest Gump on that ending. Did I really do that? <laughs> wow. You may have. Okay. Oh, duh. Let's move on. Thing to win is like a box of chocolates. <laughs> That's what's gonna be the title of this show. <laughs> I think. All right. So let's move on now to uh, to a segment we're gonna call the Dungeons and Dragons Roundtable. Uh, so, Bridger, yes. If, if I could just make one point, sure. Something else interesting that came out of that article was the uh, the hitboxes. They went into detail about the differences in hitboxes. Oh yeah. That the hitbox zone mm -hmm. on a Norn and Azur are going to be the same. I think that's huge for esports. Absolutely. Because now I don't yeah. have to like in World in uh, World of Warcraft. Everybody played the little dwarf because his hitbox was smaller, I believe. And now you don't have to worry about that. I think it's it, they're actually thinking about this as an esport. I'm really gr glad to see that. True, true. I mean, that's something that we knew uh, in the past, but it's good to see that they reconfirmed that, basically, and said, yes, we are sticking to that plan. Uh, and, I mean, it's, it's, it might be news to some people, too, which is it's very good to, to, to let everybody know that picking a Norn and picking an Asura isn't going to give you a mechanical disadvantage unless maybe being seen, uh, you know, standing out of the crowd is a mechanical disadvantage. Um, so, with that, let's move on to the roundtable here and talk about... Uh, the Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, what exactly... Let, let's talk Dungeons. Now, Now we did have access to one dungeon in the beta weekend events. It was called the Ascalonian Catacombs. But before we get into talking specifically about that, I want to very briefly talk about what exactly is an instance dungeon. I mean, let's say maybe there's some listeners here that don't know what we're talking about when it comes to dungeons. Let's talk about what is a dungeon, what does it do for the game. So, I mean, who's played a lot of dungeons, let's say, in World of Warcraft? That's like the reigning thing you compare everything to. I'm guilty. All right, yeah. Freelancer, you played a bunch of the instance dungeons in World of Warcraft. What, wh what is the point of their existence in the game? What do they provide to the game? Uh, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> uh, some people will tell you that it's because of the story and stuff, and they're probably lying. But most, <laughs> people, <laughs> most people, actually, they play the dungeon. Uh, it's it's all about getting that next big loot, you know. Well, World of Warcraft was very much based on tiered items and and getting points so that you could get the next tier of item. And it was that that sense of feedback that you brought up, Bridger. And um, with uh, World of Warcraft, uh, the dungeons worked very much like that. I mean, there were starter dungeons, of course, um, uh, going from starting about level twenty ish and uh, Westfall and going up from there. But oh, see, we can't talk anymore. You just said Westfall. You alliance oh, son of a... No, I'm going to bring that in here. But, um... <laughs> hey, I went to Westfall as Horde and Alliance. Oh, okay then. <laughs> but, uh, I ran no, Deadmines as an orc, man. <laughs> Actually, there was an area in the Barrens that was lower level than that, but nobody ever went there. So, you anyways. mean the Wailing Caverns? Yes, exactly. I love the Whaling Caverns. That was my fa it was one of my favorite instances. And actually. Rage Fire, I believe. Rage Fire yeah, was 13. My ears. You don't like Whaling Any, Caverns? Anyways, anyways, we're talking wow, but the whole point of, <laughs> the whole point of it was when you got to the actual stuff that matters starting with about Molten Core, uh, and then people really started to get serious. Well, at that point it was no longer really about the story. It was about you as a guild who could complete the most content the fastest, the most efficiently. Uh, it was basically guilds were formed literally around this about basically around achievement guilds or progression guilds as they call them and wow uh, you, I don't think you're going to really see that in Guild Wars uh, too the way it's being designed but um, these progression guilds I was part of a, a many different ones uh, they are just you know, five nights a week. They're the ones that you see all these books written about. You know, these <laughs> gamers that, that are, you know, that five nights a week they, they ruin their own lives because they have to be, you know, there every single night. And um, 
it's it, it's not for everybody, but that's what it turned into. Is Guild Wars 2 like that? I don't think so at all. First off, raids or, or dungeons, and um, they they call them raids in WoW, uh, were 20 all the way up to 50-man things. Um, you would have entire guilds doing this, you know, facing Anixia, starting off, and then going all the way up to Frozen Throne and through there. Um and it started. Then they have hardcore modes and all this. Whereas in Guild Wars Two, they kept it to five people. Now, what do you guys think about limiting, limiting? Spit this out. The the dungeons to five people only. Do you think there should be bigger ones? No. No. I really no, like why it. Why not? <clears throat> I mean, we're going to get into it. The Aslan Catacombs Explorable is the hardest thing I've ever done in any game. <laughs> there's this boss that he gives you three seconds, and there's like a buff that comes on him for like one second. If you don't dodge roll or do something to get out of there, you die. And it takes about 15, 20 minutes to DPS him with no adverse effects. And all five people are just blasting him. Well, we'll talk minutes. about different kinds of difficulty in a second. And yeah. so these the mechanics they apply in these harder dungeons are so difficult that if you were to play them in larger groups, they'd be almost impossible to complete, and you'd have to tone them down in their difficulty, and it would lose the idea of being the top tier end game content. That's what they're designing it for. They're not designing it for what everyone should do. That's true. Uh, so so let, let's talk for a second um, about, about I guess, the, the five-man versus versus 40-man thing. My, my real uh, reason for enjoying the five-mans better is basically because I feel like my contribution matters. In a 40-man raid... Uh, a lot of the time, I mean, we talked about this before when we talked about add-ons, that guilds had to have special add-ons to tell them which of their 40 members weren't actually, you know, holding their own and, or pulling their weight. Because you can't tell if you've got 40 people in there. You can't see who's doing what unless you have a special calculator keeping track of Johnny went to pick up a pizza and he just left the, the one button on his <laughs> mouse stuck down. You know, you can't tell that. So when, when I'm 20% of the team, I really know that I am really responsible for this team's success or failure just as much as anybody else here, and you can feel it, and your performance can really matter. And I like that feeling more than just being lost in the crowd and not mattering, you know, not feeling like, uh, you know, I can carry anything, I guess, etc. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I guess that's, like, I want to carry my team on my back. I, I want to be able to say that beating the dungeon was partly because of me, not I was one of forty people that did it, you know. When, I, I don't it, know. I mean, there it depends on on how you look at it. Some guilds, especially some of the ones I was in, were very much even that one that one guy. Like I played a rogue, you know. That's no surprise there. But playing as a DPS, especially as a melee DPS for me, I mean, everybody, every DPS on that, everything from the rangers, the rogues, the mages. They all had a spot. Like I knew I had to reach 14k DPS during that fight, or I was out tomorrow. You know, Every, everybody felt like they had a certain position. World of Warcraft. I just think that it's far more personalized than Guild Wars 2. Do you agree? Yeah, definitely. The other thing that five man versus forty man, besides the mechanical differences, um, a lot of the the deal with dungeons and well, I, my understanding, I never actually let me put this forward. I never played a raid in in World of Warcraft. I played a lot of the instant dungeons, but I never made it to max level when it was max level at any point. So I never played in a raid, but. Uh, my understanding from talking to people who did is it's, it's a lot of coordination and you have to know how the... It, it works similar to, to, to dungeons and the instances in World of Warcraft as well where, you know, you have to try and figure out. Every dungeon itself is a puzzle. This boss has special ways to, to beat him. If you DPS him too fast, he spawns too many ads. Like, I distinctly remember there was a stone giant in, uh, what was it, um, Old Man or something in, in World of Warcraft where yeah. I went in there with a bunch of people who had never played it before uh, and we sort of, you know, we were wiping and making our way through the, 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 the instance, and we made all the way down to the bottom, and we had a hard-as-hell time figuring out how to beat that boss. And it, and it was a, a while before we collectively realized, oh, he only spawns these extra stone guys as he loses health. So we realized we need few people, like, we were trying to, like, kill him as fast as possible, but here's a boss that changes the rules and forces you to think outside the box. That's how most of the instance, instances become an interesting... Ex, in, uh, 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 intelligence uh, sort of experience of trying to figure out what's the key to figuring out this puzzle, right? It's a logic puzzle. So 
each of them is supposed to be different in some way and making you try to think a little bit about how you do it. With 40 people, usually there's like one or two or three guys that are figuring out the strategy and just tell everybody else, okay, here's what we're going to do. Your group's going to do this. Your group's going to do that. Your group's going to do that. And all the thinking is done by a few people. Whereas if everybody, if there's only five people, everybody's contributing to that discussion for the most part. So that's another reason. Uh, I, I mean, I could tell you haven't played Endgame because I'll, I'll have to disagree with you there. Okay. When you're running hardcore Ice Crown, for example, it, everybody has to be completely on par with the way the mechanics work. I mean, I'm not just, saying they shouldn't. They don't have to be on par. It's just that the people figuring it out. But I mean, it out, it's not. It, it's it doesn't get to the point where I have to tell members on how to do a certain thing. If they don't know how to do it, they're not there in the first place because it just doesn't work at that point. It's 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 very unforgiving. Well, when once you it's on farm to, status, sure. But when you're still trying to figure out the puzzle, right? I mean, yeah, I can well, also agree that. Good. Uh, we can also agree that Guild Wars 2 is a much more active gameplay. You know, it's not like when you're a rogue, you just sit on the back of the guy DPSing him, and then you get out of the way for something or you break off. You're constantly moving around. You're constantly dodging. You're constantly dealing with ads. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying Guild Wars 2 isn't an upgrade. You know, to the whole idea. I'm just saying that. Give a little bit of credit to WoW. You know, let's not bash it Oh, yeah, completely. no, I'm not trying... I, I, this is my personal preference, why I feel like I would enjoy five-man dungeons. I'm not trying to, to put down and say, the rating is terrible, and it should never be in Guild Wars 2 ever, because of here. Um, I don't know why I just went southern with that. That was weird. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, uh, um, your thoughts, five versus 40-man. Well, the 40-man thing is, uh, is all well for numbers, and I think the five-man contributes a lot more to gameplay than just straight numbers. Oh, so you're saying the five-man is all about min-maxing and trying to get max damp DPS and things like that? No, I'm, I'm not even saying that. I'm just saying that you, you watch your thing. You've got your five people. You can keep a, you can keep a closer eye on the five-man than you can, ever can on a 40-man unless you're a freelancer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot of add-ons and stuff as well. I mean, I, I wasn't the one running most of the raids, but... They're the guild leaders or the raid leaders at that time. You know they have all these add-ons and stuff. And uh, looking back on it now in hindsight, there probably wasn't a good idea because a lot of people got spoiled on these add-ons. A lot of good healers were actually pretty bad healers. They would just rely on these add-ons, and uh, there was a very clear difference between those that relied on it and those that didn't rely on it. But in Guild Wars 2, you can't rely on that. So. Uh, it's more based on player skill. Again, you know, if that giant minotaur is about to swing his hammer at Bridger, if Bridger doesn't dodge, everybody's going to see he doesn't get do doesn't dodge because I, he's going to yeah. be sent Ooh, flying what? across the room. Why do all the <laughs> examples of someone failing involve me? That's what I want to know. I have oh, no all of my that. examples of failing involve Edwin. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's let's jump to a different topic here. So, what features? Let's say either either in past dungeons or even in Ascalon, Ascalonian catacombs, what features of a dungeon make it really interesting and fun to you? What kinds of things in the dungeon? Because for me, I really enjoy the sort of, like I said, like the mechanics that sort of make you think outside the box. The ones that are like, okay, this isn't just one that you can immediately look at it and go, okay, for this boss, we need to do this, this, and this. It's clear that this is blah, blah, blah. Like, I like the ones that use the environment where you have to kind of do something in the room. Uh, like, I remember in Nomergon... and hit buttons to turn them off before they attacked. It, like, so different things, coming up with brand new ideas about how to create cool mechanics. That's, that's one of the things that I think makes a really cool dungeon. But what do you guys, what do you guys think? Prowl, what, what makes a really great dungeon experience? What features? I kind of have to agree with you there, Bridger. The, the mechanics are, are probably one of my favorite things. Like stepping into a dungeon for the first time and actually seeing the boss and actually, okay, you have to stay on this side of the room, you have to stay on this side. This much DPS has to be put on. You have to be back three steps. The mechanics really make the dungeon for me because otherwise, I'll just stand there in the same spot and press the one skill like a lot of people did when they played the dungeon. They just got wrecked because they didn't know how the, the mechanics worked of dodging around, using the environment to their advantage, and actually where they needed to be. So I have to agree with you there. Yeah, I, I love trying to figure out dungeons for the first time. I mean, let me ask you, uh, Umph, if, if you're playing a dungeon for the first time, do you want to play it with other people that already know what they're doing and they're just going to tell you, hey, do this, do this, do this, or would you prefer to play it with other people who are figuring it out for the first time? 
Oh, it depends on the people. If I've got my group, core group of people that I'm playing with, and we're going to a thing for the first time, then we're all we're all good. we we can figure things out and we can work around it. But uh, if I'm trying to, if I'm trying, if I'm behind the curve and I'm going through a dungeon and I just want to get it done, then I want to be with the people who have done it before and can tell me, hey, stand here, hey, don't move for two seconds or something of that nature. All right, so I know Freelancer said story in dungeons never matters, but Edwin, did, did you ever enjoy a dungeon more if it felt like, you know, what, what we're doing here makes sense and, and there's a story element here? I mean, the WoW raids, I liked reading the lore outside of them, but actually going to them, it's too hectic. The Guild Wars 2, especially Ascalon Catacombs, you know, you knew the, the explosion and everything that happens. And so everything that happens as a result, the cutscenes and the way the bosses fight and the things they're yelling at you while you're playing and the voice acting especially, it definitely envelops you into the story and it makes you enjoy it more because of it the, against other dungeons that you played in other games. You know what I'm sick and tired of, Bridger? What's that? Going into a cave. Why does every dungeon have to take place <laughs> in a cave? <laughs> <laughs> like, That's a good question. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, when I do go to a dungeon, usually it's for the achievement points because I'm an achievement whore. <laughs> and I have to go into a cave every single time and it's dark and dreary. What, what, where is the dungeons that are bright and, and like in a desert or, or something? Because that's, you know, I played through Guild Wars 1. Uh, did it did it just for the 30 HOM points with the guild members. I was not a big GVGer. But when I was playing through Guild Wars 1, I was like, this is incredible. Some of these missions are so unique. Like, it, I, I was just engrossed in it. I actually enjoyed my PvE experience doing that. Um, and while it seemed like 90% of the dungeons were either A, in a dark, bluish cave, or B, in a dark... W- cave with lava or <laughs> or just a dark cave with purple crystals sticking out the walls and the troll dungeons <laughs> i mean <laughs> it was that's right the troll dungeons the uh, the oh i can't remember it now but yeah the Zul, troll dun- whatever oh, yeah zold aman or something anything with a crazy jamaican it seemed, accent it just seemed like in guild wars one and and i haven't seen this yet in guild wars two at least from what i can see so far that everything is sort of back into the caves you know and while that's fine if i want to dive into caves all day i'll play torchlight you know and then <laughs> uh, um that's uh, that's the way I look at PVE. It's if I want to go there, I want to try something new. I mean, a lot of the best games that I put on the top of my list, like Half Life, for example. I mean, or uh, Bastion. You know, another recent one I played, an incredible game. Think about the areas those games placed you in. It was it was completely different everywhere you went. Mm-hmm. Where I don't see that so far in Guild Wars 2. So I'm hoping you know, it, if, as far as PVE, which. You know, I always say I'm not going to do it and stuff, but eventually I'm going to be there for one reason or another. I hope that I see things different other than just diving into caves and catacombs. Yeah. Well, Guild Wars 1 shoved things in the cave with the uh, Eye of the North expansion when they put the dungeons in there. And I think that's more of so that they don't have to sacrifice a large portion of the map for the actual dungeon. So mm-hmm. all for the sake of Bridger's immersion, they throw <laughs> things into these holes. <laughs> Well, that's, I think that's part of it. I think in, in other games, like, wow, they throw it into a hole because it's an instance, and that's a really easy way to confine players and keep them in a specific path. If, I mean, a cave network, by definition, has its own specific path, and you can't go, you know, you can't explore, you know, any direction. Uh, I mean, with Zola Garub and Zolaman, they, they did that by having this sort of weird temple structure where you had to go around these, these mold thing, but... I, I agree that I hope that in Guild Wars 2, some of the dungeons that we haven't seen yet, obviously we've only really seen uh, Ascalonian Catacombs and one other one there was like a PC Gamer that we saw something about. Um, and, and so I don't remember what the PC Gamer one. Does anybody in the chat remember where the PC Gamer one takes place? Did they mention that one? I think it's the Silvari one or something like that. Uh, but yeah, I would love to see some more outdoorsy ones. I really hope the final dungeon against Zaitan is sort of an outdoor fight. I mean... Actually, I think we can almost assume, based on that cutscene, not the cutscene, but the release video, where we see the dirigibles fighting a dragon, that seemed like that's something that would be in an instance. That seemed like something that would be in a dungeon, especially because it seemed like the the Destiny's Edge were there. Like, they show you a picture of Destiny's Edge on a on a dirigible. Thank you, umph. Was it umph that's a dirigible? No, nope, that was <laughs> Edwin, thank you, Edwin. Uh, you see Destiny's Edge on a dirigible, and then it shows the dir- a dirigible fight firing at a dragon. So that seems like a really cool kind of instance thing. Uh, or maybe it's just a cutscene, I mean, for all we know. But I-, I really hope that's a cool dungeon that we'll see towards the end. 
I think all the, the most popular dungeons, the most popular maps in gaming history period were always incredibly bright maps. You know, all right, let's think about like Counter Strike, you know, D E Dust. We all know that was the most popular map. And Are you Team kidding Fortress, me? Mansion was way better. It was all dark and rainy. I'm just telling you the most popular, though. <laughs> no, I know. I mean, it's by far, you go through any game, the most popular maps or the most popular dungeons were always incredibly bright, 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 bright. Now, why do you think that is, Bridger? Uh, that's a good question. It might just be because people enjoy daylight, and so it gives some sort of psychological plug uh, to, to, their, to their mind. I don't know. It's just, it seems to me like if... If ArenaNet wants to make the ultimate dungeon or the ultimate end sequence, if they made it bright, I think it would be that much more popular. And maybe that's just a, a personal opinion. But like, I, I can't help but think that in every instance, um, TF2, uh, it, it's just always bright. They, they re Somewhere along the way, developers realize that brighter areas, while still encompassing that evil, uh, is, is a win scenario. I'm just hoping that they have more of those in Guild Wars 2. I'm not also, sure if it's going to take place like in a, in a bright area. It's supposed to take place in Nara, in Or, which was sunk under the sea for 250 years until Zaitan brought it above. So it might be kind of dark and gloomy, I, I feel. But we know it won't be underground because I don't think anything could fit an Elder Dragon underground. That's what I was thinking, too. Like, it <laughs> has to be, right? It has to be outside. All right. Anyway, let's uh, let's move on to the next point here that we we're going to talk about. Let me look at my show notes here. Um, so let's talk about the Asclonian Catacomb specifically. I played it through about half of it before we had to go to a World v. World thing in the last beta. Um, but uh, I know that uh, some of you guys played through the story mode, the whole thing. Let's talk about the story mode. Um, without actually spoiling the story for anybody, let's try to avoid doing that. But, uh, you know, I went through it and I played two different of the bosses, I guess you could say, in there. And um, leading up to them, there was actually quite a few little traps and rooms that would just have special things that like, oh, you better watch out for this because if you're not careful, then it's going to do something cool. So in the middle of a fight, you have to be aware of these traps and these other things that are going on in there. And I felt like that made the whole, okay, let's clear all the trash mobs and get to the boss thing a lot more interesting. Interesting. Any thoughts? Uh, let's go, Umf. Well, I thought that the uh, the first time we ran through cat catacombs, the uh, I had a couple of guildies rush me to thirty, basically just so I could get my elite. So we oh, we, yeah. rushed, we we slammed through story mode, and we had no problem at all. Um, but uh, the the a later time when we ran, I ran through story mode with a different set of people in a later in a later beta weekend. Um, we had considerably more difficulty so i don't know if they've ramped up certain things in there i wasn't able to pay enough attention to see what had changed and what hadn't changed but something had definitely changed whether it was the group composition or the actual difficulty of the dungeon itself so let's say uh story-wise because we all seen that cutscene now at the beginning of there and you have the characters you have Ritlock that's 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 joining you and later on you, you find air that's a whole point of the in dungeon so you see that right in the beginning hopefully it's not a spoiler for anybody you get there and Ritlock's all like that stupid air we have to go and save her I mean we have to stop her from meddling with the ghosts uh you know very 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 annoyed and trying to go and save the day thing so you have the characters, you have King Adelburn, where you see in the cutscene, you know, you're going to go fight this guy kind of a thing. I, I like the characterization. That little bit, it's just one cutscene, but it really feels like that adds a lot to, like, you really know what your mission is. I mean, I compare that to, uh, like, when I went to do, like, Scar in, in World of Warcraft, and it's like, the only way to know any idea why I'm there or why I'm killing these guys is to read the quest text and even then it wasn't always it was like okay well i didn't get the quest from the capital city to come here all i did was get the quest outside here so that i i missed the whole reason for why i'm here and all that other stuff and freelancers looking at me like why do you even bother the reason to go in there was loot duh <laughs> but i mean i thought that added a lot to it well i went in there i was kind of curious because the rest of the guild members i saw edwin going in there um, I saw I'm going in there, Malkir, a couple of the other guys in our guild are all, and they were they were having a blast. I went in there and and can I give my opinion real quick, Bridget? Yeah, go ahead. This, all right, 
I play straight from the PvP, PvP per, man. Yeah, I, I play PvP nonstop. I decide, okay, we have the World v. World map taken. I'm going to go try it out. And I went in there, and it seemed like I spent more time beating on the random ghosts coming out of caskets than the bosses themselves. There was two bosses in particular. The one that's the archer that sits on his pedestal mm -hmm. by himself. Do you know which one I'm talking yep. about? Uh, Nente. Yeah. That Major was an interesting Nente. fight. I enjoyed that one um, because that sort of involved different mechanics. I mean, he teleported back and forth, and it kind of threw off people. There was another fight where you had to separate two, two uh, uh, I guess they were mesmers of some sort. Uh, it was like the lovers. Yeah. And uh, that was also an interesting fight. It kind of brought back the way back when, when it was back in uh, Ice Crown, actually. You had to do a similar mechanic with two bosses there. Um, but it was still sort of was simplified. Now, my question is, and this is, I guess this is also for the audience, what is the difference between story mode and when you actually beat story mode and you get into explorable? Well, that goes to Edwin and Umf, I think, who have, who have played Explorer. I never played Explorer by myself. Do you mean, like, mechanically or difficulty-wise? Yeah, or? like, is it, diff is it more difficult? Is it, like, actually a challenge? Like, is how does that a, work? Yeah, let's, let's go. Well, First of all, is it a different actual map? Like, are you going to a different place? Or are there different places? Sometimes. Right. It's, it's, it's you have the, different pathways. Go ahead, Edwin. Like, you have the different pathways, but it's the same zone, essentially. It's just... So a lot the of future, the, a lot of the same places are reused, but you may go on tangents that you haven't seen in the story mode. Yeah. Okay. So now let's let's talk about you know we you have new bosses to fight in the explorable mode, presumably, right? Oh, well, they get... Yeah, there are definitely different bosses going on in the explorable <laughs> mode. And, and you're, they going, have you're going through the map a different way. More the, uh, more mechanics the, going on. The story on? behind it is a lot different as well. I guess the, the big thing I'm wondering, though, like, between the regular mode and hardcore mode and, and WoW, there were different mechanics. Like, you had to learn entirely new skills that the bosses were throwing out. Are the mechanics, like, if, if you, either of you have done the explorable mode, um, are the mechanics different with the bosses, or is it just, like, they have more HP, is what I'm uh, getting at. Number one, it's totally different bosses, and number two, the mechanics are completely different from what you ever saw in story. Okay, that's awesome. And they're way harder, too. They're not... It's not just different mechanics. They're more difficult to attune yourself to and to be able to defeat. And the bosses have, you know, it's normal veteran champion, I guess legendary is the highest with the purple around their heads. Yeah. Right. Every boss there is legendary. Ooh, wow. Um, and so they're all extremely difficult, especially for five-man groups where you're just trying to beat on them. You know, there's legendary mobs out in the world that you may have 50 people and it takes forever. So there's... Now, it's a different experience. We've talked okay. about different kinds of difficulty in the past on diff on, a, on another show, and I don't really want to rehash into that. I, what I was going to ask is, I mean, if you consider that there's some kinds of difficulty, which is, okay, we just make the boss have way more HP, so they have to play perfect for a longer period of time. It kind of sounds like that's how some of the bosses are in Explorable. Are they all like that? The uh, A couple of the bosses are a lot higher difficulty and a lot more there's a lot more to beat down about them but that's just because of the fact that they are legendary and uh not so much just to kill time yeah i'm just wondering because i mean there's there's different ways to make something difficult it can be either you know hard to figure out or you have to nail the timing on a number of different things or you have to get the positioning right and then nail the timing but if it's just okay you have to constantly nail the timing for 20 minutes, and that's why it's hard. Because it would be easy if it was 5 or 2 minutes, but because it's 20 minutes and you have zero room for error, that's what makes this difficult. It's simply the fact that you have to be perfect for a longer period of time. Is that the kind of difficulty that we see, or is there something that's more uh, interesting, I guess is what I'm trying to say? More fun difficulty and less frustrating, tedious difficulty? Well, I think I'm... Everything. No, let's really? not go. No, I was well, thinking, I, I, uh, as as, uh, as Britcher described that scenario, I kept thinking of Rift. There was a tier two or tier three dungeon where you had to stand inside this ring and couldn't get outside the ring and bits of camp up and went down. And I absolutely despise that dungeon, and that's what made me quit Rift. So <laughs> if I encounter that in Guild Wars 2, I'm going to be incredibly disappointed. Prowl, did you play in uh, the explorable mode at all? 
I actually wasn't high enough of a level. I, I did the dungeon and story mode at level 29 with a pug group, so I was okay. never able to make it to explore. So, so you finished the story mode. Did you, I mean, I, I played through some of the story mode. Did you, out of all the bosses, did you find, uh, you know, Freelancer mentioned that, you know, he found the, the Ranger Nente guy to be pretty interesting and fun mechanically. Did you, is, did you find him to be the best, and did you find anybody else there to be interesting as well? I, I found the lovers probably to be the most interesting because, you have to keep the two of them apart so they don't just DPS your entire group down. It's okay. also a, a completely different mechanic to work with a pug group through text than it is through team chat, like team speak. So you have to kind of coordinate before the fight goes on. Yeah. You go in there, you get wiped, then you have to reset your strategy and do it again. So it's really interesting to work back and forth between not only the different mechanics, but working with your party members. Because if the two of them get too close, their DPS goes through the roof, and you have to separate them again. So it's kind of interesting, and I really enjoyed it. Now, um, uh, did your group ever actually finish the explorable mode, or did you just? Uh, have... <laughs> we got past a couple of bosses, but we know we haven't we didn't get enough time to completely run through the entire thing. Now, did you to get an idea of the difficulty here? Um, how many attempts at these bosses? Let's let's say you went like one or two or three bosses that you got past. How many attempts at them did it take before you got past each one? Were there some easier than others? Yeah, the the, the first the first boss you kind of going to come across in there is is easy once you get the hang of it. And then the second boss took us a long time, but once again, once you pick up on the trick, you will be able to progress past that. The, okay. Uh, the third area that we got to, we just kept getting overrun, so we'll have to figure that one out the coming beta weekend. Now, let's just get your general thoughts then. Uh, Edwin, did you think the explorable mode is something that, you know, it's, it's obviously it's a challenge, uh, and it's something that, you know, if you complete that, is it going to make you feel like, yes, I'm, I'm like proud of the fact that I was able to get past that, or it's just like, oh my god, that was so annoying, I never want to have to do that again. Like, is it on that scale? Like, where is it? <laughs> I mean, I think like Umph said, once you figure out the little trick to completing it, like with the second boss, he shoots out daggers and pulls everyone in and one-shots you all. Oh, so, once so, you learn... so he's the, uh, the, the spawn of the Black Moa then, <laughs> from that. <laughs> he's essentially it's that mechanic. <laughs> But once you get a hang of like realizing, or once you get a hang of realizing that buff comes on, you dodge away and you're okay. Once you realize the mechanic, you have a second and a half, two second window, and it's pretty obvious when he's about to do it. So it's not like it has to be picture perfect timing every time. It's just it has to be good enough timing every time. Um, first boss, if you crowd control her, she spawns these champion mobs when she's a legendary, and so you, you have to like ignore this ridiculous danger and fight other stuff. <laughs> and so if you don't CC her, you're okay. And it's every boss has that kind of trick. So I think once you get to the end, you know all the boss's mechanics, and you can run through it, not necessarily perfectly, but pretty easily. And so it's one of those things that you're not going to have too much trouble with, and you're going to feel like you actually accomplished something at the end. You're not going to feel like it was a waste of time. All right. Uh, let, let's uh, sort of uh, get to the wrap-up point here. But before we go, I want to ask everybody, um, Ascalonian Catacombs. What could it use? What could improve it? Basically, let's you know. Outside of the fact that okay, we want more dungeons outside. That's a separate thing. But let's say Ascalon and Catacombs. Um, what could what could be in there that would make it more interesting? Prowl. Um, yeah, something that just in the game in general. Uh, I know they have the little white circles and red circles that tell you that what mechanics going to happen. Um, I like to see kind of like when the boss is going to use that mechanic, so it's a little bit easier for me visually to see and to plan out what I need to do. And I think that's actually something that uh, they mentioned they were going to try to do. I don't remember if that was in the ANA or, or, or one of those um, interviews afterwards, is ArenaNet basically said, we don't want to make the dungeons less difficult, but instead what we're going to do is listen to player feedback that they had a hard time specifically figuring out the boss's telegraph like, we put the telegraph in there for, for players to be able to see and dodge, but we didn't make it easy. No problem with that. Not with the difficulty and the mechanics and timing it. Like, that's supposed to be the part that makes it interesting and difficult. So it sounds like that's something they're worried about or, or, or uh, working on. So, Umph, anything that you can think of that would make Ascalonian Catacombs better? Uh, the only thing I saw in story mode is that, the uh, un unfortunately, the full fire is blue, so I kept thinking it was healing, and I'd run into it, and, well, I'd be dead. <laughs> Whoops! <Whoopsies>. Wow. <laughs> I actually think that was a, uh, a bug the first weekend. Like, uh, 
things that were damaging and were actually showing up as a hot, like, neutral zone. So I would run into it and I get one shotted, thinking that I was uh, like an ally buff or something. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't run into anything unless it's got like that little flowery design in the middle of it that says it's a healing spring from a ranger or something. <laughs> All right, Edwin, do you, can you think of anything else that would uh, benefit to make the make the experience better? I mean, the trash mobs are difficult in that they hit really hard and you have to dodge them and everything. But if they just lowered the health, because, I mean, it's trash. They give, they give good loot, but at the same time, you're, those aren't the end game. You're there to fight. I mean, the bosses they can keep, but if they just lowered the health on the trash but kept the difficulty the same, it would feel like it's not taking forever and that you're fighting a boss every single time. You're talking about forever. explorable mode specifically, or...? Either or, they just the trash. It's like a silver background. So I don't really know what it is exactly, but it's just really hard to kill because they just take a long time. Mm. Yeah, I noticed so that just, it took us a while to get to just the first boss, but we were still trying to figure our way out. We kept hitting traps and stuff because we were all we were all noobs yeah. at the time. Uh, all right, so freelancer, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, realistically, I think what would make it more fun next time I go in there will be instead of having stronger random mobs spawn where you just spend all this time, like the first part of the dungeon, you remember how you open caskets and mm -hmm. like just these little ghosts appear and they do the same thing. You just beat them down. It's a spanking tank, you know, and I think instead of forming the same single you know, ghost that pops up that takes a minute to take down, form like six lesser ghosts, you know, make more chaos happen. Um, form oh three three mage ghosts and then six warrior ghosts. You know, they don't have nearly the same HP, but more chaos again. You know, things get more excited. I think change it to up. Me, change it up is the main thing, huh? It felt too I think, similar. Yeah, I just think hitting down the same ghost over and over, you know, for the first 15 minutes while I was in there was really draining. It was like, well, what's the big deal about this? You know, like, mm -hmm. what, why is this so fun? Um, of course, the boss is made up for it, but it doesn't mean you can't fix it, you know, and you can't make it more exciting getting to now, the bosses. it is possible that this is the first dungeon, and let's assume that we're going to have players that have never played dungeons before, uh, or, or, you know, get to level 30, and they're like, oh, I should go do this thing. They might need that 15 minutes of getting adjusted to the difficulty of the mobs, so maybe that's not necessarily a bad thing for this first one, but maybe the, the next the dungeons that come after that can can change things up more so that the player is ready for okay, now it turns out we need to do a lot of AoE real quick here because otherwise they overwhelm us rather than just okay, right. everybody attacks a single mob or something. Maybe have a few stronger ones, like you're saying, and then a few times when you least expect it, when there's six of them, you know, and yeah. you have to switch up the mechanics. I agree totally. That's a, that sounds like a good idea too. I I, uh, I I I agree to all those things. I'm trying to think of anything off the top of my head that could that could make it a little better. But uh, really, I I. I I agree with the, the, the suggestions that you guys are making. I can't think of anything to add to that. Um, the last thing I do want to ask, uh, how did you guys find um, it, it was the composition class-wise, was that limiting at all? Edwin, was it limiting when you guys went in there like, oh, uh, we're having a problem with this explorable mode because we don't have X or because we have too many Y? You definitely don't want to have more than one of any class just because you want to be able to spread the effects around. Like, if you have one ranger bringing spirits, you have one necro bringing whatever, you have one guardian that's tanking kind of with shields and all that, then it lets you spread around the effects and the specializations that you're bringing because each class has its own specialized thing. And so you definitely don't want to stack the same class. So you can't do five rangers in that dungeon and have a good time with it. <laughs> but you, if you, you do five rangers, rangers, you're going to have a bad time. Yeah, like, you can have... You know, Armstrong went as a DPS and I went as a support. I brought a bunch of spirits and stuff. So it, it there's leniency, but it's not – it's designed for preset groups. It's not designed just to pug like five people and just go for it. All right. Umph, do you agree with that? I would agree with that for the most part. I'm sure, I'm sure that as we uh, progress far, farther, uh, specialized people will – Grab their five rangers just to just, just to spite Edwin and walk through it. <laughs> oh, I'm sure just... that's gonna be like the first video on YouTube. It's gonna be like, hey, check it out, Edwin. See what I did here? Five rangers. <laughs> but uh, for the uh, for, for the that your your diversity is your greatest friend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That sounds about right. All right, uh, so I think that about uh, wraps it up. We're coming up on a on a good amount of time here. Freelancer, I think you wanted to mention something before we go. Yeah, we started doing that uh, the guild shout out thing. We asked you guys, all of you listeners, if you're running a guild or if you're in a guild and you want to get your name out there. Well, the launch date is uh, what's what's the date, Bridger? Say it one more time. 
It's August 28th. <laughs> it starts August on the 25th for anybody that pre-purchases. And if you yeah. haven't pre-purchased, you're a loser. So, so you got a lot of guilds out there that have been around a long time. Other guilds just starting up. And we started this thing in Tales of Tyria for all of you watching. That if you want to get your guild sort of a shout out, you're looking to recruit more people from the, the audience. Or if you're looking to recruit more from that watch us on iTunes and YouTube, etc. We're, uh, we're featuring you guys. So... The first guild uh, that I want to feature, just throwing it out real quick, is uh, Lords of the Dead. They've been around quite a long time, since about 1995. Uh, the guild actually is currently opening up its doors for recruitment. It's an awesome guild that has been featured in a lot of different magazines. Uh, MMO Gamer, I believe there was a Beckett uh, article on them as well. And this is a guild that's been established and been around a long time. Um, they do recruit 18+, plus, um, but... The most important thing about them is that you're not getting into something that you're not sure will be around a few months from now. The, the structure they have established is amazing, um, and the history goes way back. So if you guys are looking, um, the first guild we're featuring, LOTD, that is found at LOTD.org, uh, are opening their doors. And again, if anybody else has a guild out wow. there, uh, shoot it out to us. Uh, we'll get your name out there, try to help out the community, uh, especially you guys, the smaller guilds are starting up. Um, because I think the coolest thing we could all do, especially in anticipation for World v. World, is get a lot of strong guilds like LOTD out there. So um, that's all I got. Excellent. All right. Feedback at TalesOfTyria.com is how you can get a hold of us for that and uh, well, any other things. If you have any suggestions, we've got seven more episodes to do here, ladies and gentlemen. Only seven. Can you believe it? How am I going to fill that up? I don't even know. Next week, again, remember that we are going to likely have a, a change of time. We're going to maybe do it earlier for Europeans. So keep a, keep a close eye on, uh, on the... What is that? <laughs> oh, that's me. <laughs> I hit the fast <laughs> mode. That's what it's I supposed to sound like. I was willing to like. blame Edwin. <laughs> oh, all right, here we go. I'm sorry. Next time on Tales Bloopers. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Next time on Tales of Tyria. All right, here we go to you. Tell you all about the cool things. All right, thanks, guys, for tuning in. Remember, next week, keep an eye on the on the, on the the website. We might be at 8 o'clock. We might be earlier. Uh, that's on TalesofTyria.com. Feedback at TalesofTyria.com is how you can get a hold of us. Thank you, guys, for tuning in. It's been Dungeons & Dragons, baby. Have a good one. See you, guys. See you. Did I time that well? Holy crap! <laughs> yeah, I, did not, yeah. I didn't had no idea that was gonna, <laughs> that was a complete coincidence. Um, now you see at the beginning of that, like in the middle of that, with the Asura like leaping. What the hell are they doing? How do they do that? I wanna, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> They're flying almost. How are they jumping that far? That's it's crazy. Amazing. Do they have like a racial that lets them like fly through <laughs> the air? <laughs> <laughs> They got springs in their boots. Oh, there. Yeah. oh, of course. They're all engineers. They got rocket boots. <laughs> that must be it. All right. Whew. Well, that was a good time. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And thanks, uh, Prowl and Umph, for jumping on in our time of need. Not a problem. Anytime. I'm sorry we didn't get to talk too much to you guys. Freelancer jumped on and said, up, oh, nice show. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pleasure being on, Bridger. That was a good time, man. Got to get a better microphone if you want to come on again, though. <laughs> we got to get oh, that absolutely. fixed. Absolutely. Oh, man. Uh, they, I hate those desktop things. They they seem fine until you listen to them. <laughs> it's really what it comes down to. Well, no, I mean, wow. I guess if, if, if you're doing, like, you know, even if you're doing push to talk, you can still hear, like, whenever you turn on your mic, I hear <sighs> in the background. And as an audio guy, it drives me crazy. It's one of those things you don't hear unless you're looking listening for it, and I'm constantly listening for it. All right. 
I'm going to shut down the stream. We were on like for four hours or something after last week's show. So I'm going to shut down the stream <laughs> and we're going to uh, pull this down so my wife can get back in here and play some more League. She was trying to watch uh, Law and Order or something outside and the Netflix was going down. So it might be that she's very angry right now that she can't come in and, wa- and do something. So I'm going to shut this down and uh, we'll get uh, we'll, we'll get some more Guild Wars 2 coming out next week again. Uh, remember, don't forget, it's not necessarily at 8 o'clock next week. So if you don't forget, uh, don't say I didn't warn you. Because I did this time. Not necessarily <laughs> the Tales of Tyria. <laughs> not necessarily Terry Tyria 